Today, we're going to talk about this, the Nespresso pod, one of coffee technology's greatest success stories. Nestle was able to build a multi-billion dollar business, turning espresso into a microwave meal. It was more convenient, it was very easy to make, but it was much more expensive, and you could probably make something better yourself from scratch if you had the inclination. But many people loved the convenience of them, and they were suddenly everywhere. But in 2014, Nespresso lost a patent case against Juulit, and then suddenly anyone could put their coffee in a Nespresso-compatible capsule. And that should level the playing field. I mean, sure, not every independent roaster can afford a George Clooney, but they can afford to buy and roast a much higher quality of coffee than what Nespresso were putting inside the capsules. But it wasn't a level playing field. There's more technology in these things that no one really talks about, and I want to get into it today because we can learn from it and it's just super interesting. We'll break this down into three parts. Firstly, we'll talk about the capsule itself. Then we're going to talk about the coffee inside it that does things that really don't make any sense. And then finally, we're going to talk about what we can learn and apply from these things into potentially refillable Nespresso pods if you want to use those, or just think about our coffee brewing day to day. So for comparison, this is a independent Nespresso capsule. You know, it looks very similar. You would use them in a machine like this one here. This is a classic of the genre. This is the Magimix Initia. I think they must have made probably millions of these things. They're cheap, they're everywhere. I find them in hotels still, fun places like that. They're very cheap to make, they're very easy to use. You put water in the back, you turn them on, you load a capsule, you push a button, you get coffee about 30 seconds later from it being cold and off. So incredibly quick to use. But there's aspects to this that I think are really interesting. Before we get into it, we should look just quickly at the capsules themselves. Now, you'll see that these are both aluminium bodied capsules. They are a similar shape. They both have a foil lining across the top. If you look really closely though, you'll see one very small difference on the underside. And that's, that's here underneath the capsule sort of rim. On the Nespresso capsule, you can see a kind of silicon gasket there. You can't see that gasket on this independent pod. Why would that matter? Well, Nespresso still have the patent on this little gasket piece here, and that turns out to be quite necessary to have a good experience with a bunch of machines out there on the market. Now, if we open this thing up, it will make more sense. That's what this is. I, I, I took a broken one of these and I've dismantled it so we can understand a bit more about what's going on. Now, when you lift the handle, move it backwards and forwards, you're moving this piece around inside. But if I take this piece off, things start to make more sense. When you load a capsule into this machine, it drops down and then you push it in here. And as you push it back, like that, the machine pierces the back in three places. Three little holes in the back of the capsule. That's where it's going to pump water in from. Now, in order to have a good seal, this capsule here must fit very snugly against this piece here, otherwise water could leak from around the sides of the capsules. Now, this is an issue for independent pods because they don't have the little silicon gasket. And then to make life even harder for independent capsules, well, the bit that they sit against on this machine is not a smooth piece. It's actually got little tiny ridges, almost as if it's designed to leak if there isn't a silicon capsule there. I'm not saying that it is, I'm just saying it's an interesting choice to make it a kind of jagged toothed edge there. This would give a strong competitive advantage to an espresso capsule in a machine like this, because lots of independent capsules would just leak and a leaky pod, well, that's not a good experience. That doesn't encourage you to go back and buy the same independent capsules again. It encourages you to stick with Nespresso and keep using those over and over again. Now, the rest of the technology in these machines is, is really incredibly simple. Uh, you can sort of see what's going on here a little bit more. This is at the base of your water tank and water's gonna get drawn in here through a little flow meter. This piece here, is your pump, it's your vibration pump that makes a lot of noise. There's a little board on the back. And then the last piece of tech really is this little water boiler. And the real win for Nespresso as an experience is the fact that this thing gets very hot very quickly and that the actual precision of the temperature, well, it doesn't matter that much. With really high quality specialty coffee, you want a pretty narrow band of brewing temperature. If your coffee is much darker in roast, having it be 80, 85, 90 Celsius, isn't going to massively impact the taste experience. You're not going to get really sort of variable acidity or anything like that. You're going to have a, a surprisingly consistent experience for a massive variable in your brew temp. The upside for the user is, well, within 30 seconds of thinking about wanting an espresso, they have one in their cup. And that is a kind of magical experience. Going back here, 
If you look down the barrel of this thing, you can see the little prongs that pierce the capsule. So water gets pumped in there. And then the other part of the capsule sits against this thing here, this kind of waffly piece. Now, this is important. It's common to all independent capsules and Nespresso, but the water will pump into the back of this thing here, but this foil initially will be sealed. So there'll be a period of kind of pre-infusion until the pressure builds so much that the foil is pressed against the kind of waffly material, uh, it breaks, and Espresso is able to flow out. And there's nothing very clever after this. There's just a, a hole to a little spout that will then drip out of the front here. So there's no kind of pressure control devices or anything like that. They're really very simple. Now, in response to this issue with the sealing of the capsules, well, independent businesses took an interesting approach. They started to make their own kind of independent Nespresso machines that didn't have the same issue. If you open up this machine uh, and you can look and feel inside where the capsule sits, there's actually a sort of silicon gasket that the capsule sits against so that it isn't going to leak. That is very clever, it's very simple, but that's why there's suddenly this push for independent, non-Nespresso branded, Nespresso compatible machines. This one's a little bit slower to use in terms of getting hot, which I don't think is a bad thing because I'd rather have some more precision and higher temperatures, but it's a good example of kind of uh, fixing a weird problem that most people didn't know existed. But it isn't the only tech in these little capsules. Let's open one up. As we look, into the bottom of these little Nespresso capsules, we'll see one fundamental difference. You'll see in the bottom of the Nespresso sort of capsule, it looks like there's a bunch of coffee collected and stuck to something. That is basically a little piece of paper that isn't present in this. You'll have seen people using things like puck screens on Nespresso makers, or even putting a filter paper on top of their Nespresso puck to help distribute the water more evenly across the coffee. That's basically one more little patent that Nespresso have that no one else does that means they can do a better job of distributing the water coming in at those three points. With this capsule, the water will come in at those three points and sort of shoot like three jets of pressurized water through the coffee. Here, that paper will buffer that, help the spread, help the evenness of the, of the extraction, and it will help make better tasting coffee. We should get into brewing some coffee because that's where things get really interesting and kind of counterintuitive and shocking to my little brain. I'll start with this. It's the little festive edition Nespresso have out right now. I do enjoy the uh, truthfulness of their taste descriptor. It has one. It's not cereal, surprisingly. It's woody, which for the rest of the coffee industry is a straight up sort of uh, defect word. When coffee, raw coffee gets very old, it tends to taste a bit woody. So um, that's a weird thing to promise, but I'm sure they'll deliver. The thing I want you to pay attention to is how quickly it brews. So fast, so quick. Let's put in an independent capsule from the specialty roaster and compare and contrast. So let's talk grind size. This fast brewing shot, you would think, okay, it's a darker roast, they're gonna grind it coarser, it'll extract pretty well, and they'll have a fast but reasonably extracted shot. Specialty coffee needs a finer grind. It's gonna be a lighter roast. We've gotta grind it much finer, and that's why this shot is slower. Turns out you're dead wrong. Completely wrong, shockingly wrong. Now we now have a fancy particle size analyzer here in the studio, so we can actually look at the particle size inside capsules, and what I found was astonishing to me. This capsule is ground notably finer than this one here. On average, I think the particle size moves uh, between one and 200 microns finer. This is close to a kind of normal espresso grind. This is actually quite a bit coarser. In some cases, people might be grinding independent capsules because if they don't have a good seal, the more pressure that gets built inside the capsule, the more likely it is to leak. But ultimately, if you go finer with specialty coffee with most grinding tech, you just can't have a pod that doesn't choke. You know, it, it would take a minute to two minutes at a grind setting like this because no one has the same grinder tech as Nespresso. That's kind of it. That's the interesting piece to me. Now, we can look in the particle size analyzer and, and try and see differences in shape. And you might look at this initially and think, ooh, the Nespresso pod has more fines. It's not only finer in grind, but it's got more fines. How, how is that happening? 
but if you dive a little deeper, you'll see that it has less fines under 30 microns, which are really fine fines. And so that seems to be really key in the way that these things brew and extract. And to be honest, I still look at that distribution and I look at the way that they brew, and my, my brain can't quite match the two things up. This is so much coarser as a grind setting. It would feel coarser, look coarser. It is coarser, but it brews so much slower. Nestle's grinding tech is the best in the world, potentially. They're able to do a combination of shape, size, distribution, whatever it needs to be, to have this thing brew incredibly fast, but also brew uh, with a good extraction. Now, I spoke to one roaster who said, okay, but this is just a function of darker roasts, and you just, you know, even Nespresso couldn't put lighter roasts in there and make it work. This, this is a light roast challenge, they're always gonna brew slower, but then Nespresso just dropped this ridiculous pod. Look at that fanciness, so very fancy. Oh. Look, this, you even get the tasting card specialty. There's nothing they can't steal from us. Inside here are five pods, because it's just you just want five, because they're two pounds 15 each. If you want to back solve that, the coffee in here costs, roast and ground, 389 pounds a kilo. That's what, just under $500 a kilo? And it's from Nestle. Anyway, this was interesting because we analyzed the color of this thing, something else we can do here, we can look at roast color on something like an Agtron scale, and while most Nespresso is much darker than specialty, this was within one Agtron point of a specialty roaster, and yet they were grinding it so much finer. It's just, their tech is just better. It's just, they're better at grinding coffee than anyone else putting coffee in these little capsules, and that feels unfair, but it is the truth. We should have a little taste of this, shouldn't we? Now that is a little bit slower than the rest of the pods, but it's still pretty quick in comparison to independence. Let's have a little taste. First up, woody winter. You know, yes, yeah, it's woody. It's just not that much of anything, quite surprisingly. Let's try an independent specialty pod. Flavor, sweetness, texture, much better, uh, much more complex. Clearly, you could taste a sort of high quality raw material in there. Let's compare it to the very expensive Nestle version. Hmm. It's sort of a halfway house. It's not as good as this, but it's better than I thought it would be. Independent roasters are comfortably out-competing them in the format when it comes to flavor, but on tech, not even close. Now, from all we've learned, uh, I'm interested in what we could apply to things like reusable Nespresso capsules. Those are really popular amongst lots of people, and I think there are things we can definitely kind of patch across in our understanding of coffee technology. So let's talk about how we apply what we've learned to the world of reusable Nespresso pods. Now, I did two things to prepare for this. Firstly, get my grind right. I used the particle size analyzer to match my grinder to the Nespresso sort of particle size. Granted, I have a very fancy grinder in the studio, a Weber EG1, but I wanted to set myself up for success here. And as you'll see, as I show you a comparison between the two, it's, it's pretty close, but it's not identical. I don't have the fancy roller mill grinders that Nespresso do. I've got a fancy flat burr grinder. Let's see what happens. And then I bought three different kinds of reusable capsules. I'll walk you through them. Firstly, there's these ones here. It's a metal bodied sort of capsule. It does come with a bunch of these little silicon gaskets for the back here. These fall off sometimes, which is a bit annoying, and I assume you lose them, so that's where you get extra. These, when you seal them, you do so with a little kind of sticker foil lid. Then you've got the kind of cheapest option, which is just a kind of plastic capsule. It has a little mesh piece that folds over, clips in, and you'd brew it like that. And then thirdly, interesting approach here. These ones were metal capsules and metal lids. It's kind of a sort of straining mesh here, and then a kind of little spout piece on the other side. Uh, and that came, quite bizarrely, with a little tamper, a surprisingly heavy tamper. Anyway, let's brew them and see what happens. Now, when it comes to sticking, two things to note. One, it's quite hard to both stick and potentially peel off afterwards. I've had some issues with that. And two, it's, a, it's, it's not a reusable piece. These are a consumable. This is one and done. So uh, good news for the manufacturer, less good news for you who's trying to cut down on waste or you know non-reusable things. Anyway, we've got a seal on it now. And that, I think, is important. Let's listen carefully as it brews. Now, 
Now, you may not have known what to listen for, but you can actually hear the sound of the foil breaking from the pressure built inside. That means that this capsule does have a kind of pre-infusion moment before the rest of the brew, unlike potentially the other capsules that don't have a sealed end, so there's no opportunity to build the pressure up. Will that be an advantage? Obviously, the downside of these things is I will later need to retrieve the sort of hot, wet, dirty capsule from the capsule bin to clean it, and that's annoying, but that's that's all of these. So let's try this one. Let's go with our metal top and bottom. Now, the instructions are not hugely clear or detailed. They say, fill the capsule and gently tamp. It doesn't even fit. That's another annoyance. I don't know why you'd make it so small. This had the kind of finest filter on the exit from the capsule, which might be a bit of a sort of a crema generating device in a funny sort of way, because this one is a little foamier than I might have anticipated. But let's start at the beginning, give them a taste. To the foil lid, your brain assumes it'll be under extracted, but the ratio of an espresso pod is such that your five, six grams of coffee are brewed with 25, 30 grams of water. That's a really long Lungo style ratio. And so it is well extracted, it's just kind of weak. I wouldn't say it's as good as the independent Nespresso pod. Let's try the cheapest option. No, that, that is under extracted still. That tastes very channely, uneven, not enjoyable. I can imagine with a very dark roast, you'd maybe get away with it, but anything specialty definitely doesn't work for me. Let's try a little tamped friend here. It's better than this, but it's not as good as this. It's it's okay, it's a little sour. It, it, it doesn't taste as evenly extracted as this one here. It's an interesting world out there. And if you think about the sort of tech involved, none of them have the advantage of that bit of paper at the start, evening out the flow of water through, through the coffee. Could you put that in yourself? I'm not sure you should, but you could. But that foil seal, I think, is a real strong advantage when it comes to better brewing. Uh, and I think that's a real place that most of the independent sort of reusable pods fall down. And I think for most people considering reusable Nespresso pods at home, they definitely won't have a grinder as capable as this one. And I think you're really gonna struggle with the results. Don't take this as a kind of endorsement of Nespresso. I am fascinated and interested by the technologies that they have. I don't really understand how they're grinding coffee the way that they are, but it's super interesting. But when it comes to drinking coffee, I want people to support local roasters, buy incredible coffees, and be able to turn them easily and inexpensively into delicious coffee drinks. I think espresso is a great way to enjoy coffee, but it's also a little bit of a hobby that has, uh, you know, a, a bit of a hurdle to get into it. You've got to spend the money on the equipment and have the time. There are other ways to make coffee that are incredibly inexpensive, hugely fun, and yield you very delicious drinks. Uh, and that's kind of what this channel is all about. But now I want to hear from you down in the comments below. I want to hear from you if you are using reusable systems and if you had any joy in ways that I haven't. Are there any tips or tricks that you want to share with me and the rest of the audience? And then if you just watch this to learn more about the technology inside there, well, was that interesting? Is there some other pattern that we should have talked about? Is there other tech that we've missed that we should look at in the future? I'd love to hear from you down in those comments below. But for now, I will say thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a great day.